Well, um, welcome back to the Fab Group. This is week three. Uh, the title is Living Life to the Max. Now you're looking at the long and detailed video uh, with all the details in here. Uh, you can always swap to the uh, short and snappy video if you want, but in order to get the most out of this, I would very much recommend that you stay on the long and detailed version. Today we're going to be looking at how you can enjoy your life as much as possible despite your lung disease and we're going to look at the NHS five ways to well-being. We're also going to look at why your mental emotional health is so important and how your thinking and your feeling can really impact on your lung disease. I'm going to talk about how you can analyse your own individual situation using a hot cross bun. And then we're going to also look briefly at the support that is out there locally for carers. We're going to talk about future care planning. What if things get worse in the future? And then we're just going to finish off with a few other ideas of what you can do after this fab group, because this is the last week. Now, as before, this video is very long, really, and you're not going to be able to easily just watch it all in one go, or I doubt that very much. I would recommend taking it in stages, pausing it, getting a cup of tea or coffee, uh, going off, doing something else and coming back to it. And I'd also recommend taking some notes down uh, because by the end you'll have forgotten uh, various tips that would be helpful to you, I think, if you don't make notes. Unless you've got a memory that's better than mine. So, how would you like your life to look? Uh, I can imagine you saying, well, I don't want this lung disease for a start. <clears throat> and that's very fair enough, but I'm meaning sort of generally, how do you, would you like your life to look? Are you the sort of person that's for real adventure and adrenaline? Uh, this is the sort of sailing that you might like to do. Uh, I enjoy sailing, so hence pictures of sailing here. Or are you the sort of person that likes to go somewhere, but you know, just within calmer seas really, but still get about and explore? Or perhaps neither of those is your cup of tea and you'd much prefer to be sort of here on the beach, just looking out and relaxing. Well, we're all individuals, we're all different, uh, but what we're looking at here is how to maximise your happiness, uh, how to improve your quality of life and uh, gain good well-being, how to be content with where you're at at this moment. And of course, the happiness that I'm talking about is different from just having fun and uh, everything going well and being pleasurable. It's a deeper happiness that can occur despite your circumstances. Now, it might not necessarily depend on good health, but I think you would agree that it's much easier to have a good quality of life um, and uh, contentment if you have good health. And, uh, and I'm acknowledging that this is more difficult for you because of your lung disease. So I think life is a little bit like a sailing boat. Um, you can either let the wind blow you wherever it wants to go, uh, or you can set your sails and steer in the direction you choose. Or possibly you can stay in the harbour. But what I'm saying here really is unless we just deliberately stop and think, uh, if we just continue through life automatically, we don't really pay much attention to how we're living or where we're going. We just sort of just meander along, letting life do to us what it what it's doing. But if we stop and think and reflect, uh, we can actually deliberately make changes to our life that is uh, for the better. We can look at what our life is like currently. Is this what we want it to be? Can we change anything to make it better? And this will improve our mental well-being. Now, you've all heard of five a day, fruit and veg, to uh, keep yourself healthy from a physical point of view. But you may not have heard of the NHS five ways to well-being, uh, which promote a healthy emotional state. A lot of research went into this. They interviewed loads of people and then analysed the data. And they found that there were five things that if people did promoted well-being and a good quality of life, regardless of whether they had severe uh, illness and disease or not. 
So these five things that you can do are free, easily achievable, and you can do them regardless of your circumstances, wherever you are. So I'm going to now go through the five ways to well-being and I'm going to use some slides that I've adapted from the Devonshire Partnership Trust organisation. And there are these five things that if you do will promote your emotional uh, quality of life and well-being and uh, taking a letter from each of them they can spell out clang if that helps you. They involve connecting with others, keeping learning being active, something that's going to be quite difficult for um, people with lung disease, taking notice of things and giving. So first of all, connecting with others. Um, this can be family or friends or neighbours, the local community, but really we were uh, designed to be relational beings. Uh, the saying, no man is an island, is really quite correct. And in prison, um, being in solitary confinement is one of the worst punishments out. So relationships and connections between people are really important to us. And you might want to think how your relationships and connections with people are going at the moment. You might want to think how you can build connections and how you can deepen friendships. But being connected isn't just about uh, connecting with other people. When we've talked on the, about these five ways to well-being in fab groups before, people have mentioned that actually connecting with yourself and having quiet moments, just connecting in with how you're doing, is also valuable. Other people have said that connecting with nature, pets and animals, uh, can also be uh, very uh, worthwhile. We have a dog, Harvey, and um, I just love spending a bit of time sitting down, uh, snuggled up to him. It is uh, very worthwhile. Other people say that connecting with God or uh, a higher spiritual force is of benefit. Other people say that there are too many connections with other people. Well, there's too many contacts. They know and they relate to too many people, but maybe they don't actually connect at a deeper level with many people at all. Um, and particularly carers have a lot of contact, um, but a lot of the contact that they have with other people is all about supporting and resolving problems. And they may have lost connection with the people and the things that they value personally. So, if you're just thinking now about how your connections are, you might want to think, is there anything that you'd like to do more of to improve your connections? Is there anything that you'd like to do less of? Are there any connections that you'd like to make with somebody else or uh, restore or remake if you've lost contact with somebody? The uh, second uh, way to well-being um, is learning, to keep learning, to continue to learn new things. Now that could mean going back to school and doing your O-levels again but that's not what really what we're meaning here. Uh, we're meaning just discover something new. Um, you could sign up for a course at a local at college or you might want to just get more into um, sewing or um, cooking or you might want to learn a, a new musical instrument. You might want to set yourself a challenge of learning how to play bridge. It doesn't have to be something big, it can be small, but evidence has shown that if you are continually learning new things, then it's really good for your brain and really good for your mental well-being. Now it's important that the learning isn't like it is in school. Oh golly, I'm going to have to do this. Uh, you want to make sure it's a oh, I'm really looking forward to doing this, or I want to do this. The other thing is, as I said before, it doesn't have to be big, it can be small. You can just find out something that you're curious about, maybe, um, maybe your family history or local history. 
you could even focus on finding out about uh, somebody else that y- that you know. You could in, uh, could make them a little bit of a project, either telling them or not telling them. It might freak them out if they they know uh, that you're wanting to find out all about their hopes and wishes, uh, what they value in life, their strengths and weaknesses. I think it's just about being inquisitive, really. You might like to find out what's happening in your local area. So some questions now just to help you reflect and think. Are you learning much? Are you learning new things each day? What would you like to learn about if you were going to focus on learning? What interests do you have? What do you value? What do you think would be useful? And how could you make learning fun and something that you'll look forward to? Well, I think the third element of the ways uh, to well-being is going to be hard for anybody with a significant lung disease because it's be active and that is very difficult if you get breathless and fatigued a lot of the time. But you can still be active whatever level of fitness and mobility you have. You might want to just get outside more and spend more time in the garden. You might want to meet your friends for a drink or go to the local garden centre or go for a short walk. Even a slow one will be beneficial. But I don't know if you remember, I think it was last week we mentioned that if you if you don't do any activity, your fatigue levels will increase. Uh, uh, and that's been shown uh, with um, scientific evidence. So you want to just stay a little bit active, even if you can't do much. Um, and not only will your physical fatigue level improve, but your mental well-being will also improve. You need to remember that moderate exercise is good for you. Moderate breathlessness is good. And just small changes in the level of activity you do can make a big difference to your well-being. I wonder whether you could enrol on the pulmonary rehabilitation course that we've mentioned before. Or whether you'd like to do some chair-based exercises at home. Or you may recall that armchair bike that I showed you, I think it was in week one or two, I can't remember. So just think back and now and just think, is there any minor adjustment that I can make in my life that will help me be more active on a regular basis? The fourth way to well-being is to take notice of what's around you. This reminds me of the mindfulness bit uh, to some extent. Uh, The suggestion is that we should be curious. We should uh, notice the beautiful. We might stop and uh, enjoy the sunset or look at a a flower, uh, a, a rose, say, as we're walking in the garden. We will just notice things more. It could be just looking at nature in the garden, but it also could be when you're out with friends. Sometimes when we're out with people, we're just not quite with it. We're not with the moment. We're thinking about what to say next or we're thinking about what we've got to do next. Uh, The take notice means actually really enjoying the here and now. I can remember one occasion, it was a big extended family meal out and it should have been a really good fun occasion. But I was annoyed with my son, I don't know what had happened, um, but I was very annoyed with him um, as we were travelling to the restaurant. And so I spent the whole meal feeling resentment and annoyance at uh, at him. He seemed to be having a fun time talking to everybody else. And I, looking back, I actually missed that moment. Um, I lost out on a fun time because I was sort of so f- focused on uh, what had just happened. Um, so try, if you're out with friends, just really enjoying the time with them rather than thinking ahead. Um, Years ago, I can remember reading this uh, um, study in the British Medical Journal. Um, At Christmas time, the British Medical Journal has some more fun, interesting articles. 
And one uh, Christmas they uh, published this study where they'd asked a hundred old age pensioner couples, if you could live your life again, how would you change it? And they came up with lots of different answers, obviously. And then they did what's called qualitative research, where they sort of try and group things together to get themes. And um, two particular themes came out. The first one is that people, if they could live their life again, would take more risks. So rather than stay in the sort of dead end job that paid the mortgage, they would... Um, uh, um, they would go back to college and um, uh, and become a nursery nurse or or something. They would take a risk and they would go for it, even though it was not uh, there was a risk involved. Um, the other thing that came out was they would reflect more in life. They would take more baths than showers. They would try and be in less of a rush. They would stop and smell the rose on the way down uh, the street. They would just take more time. And I think take notice is, in a way, um, relating that to that reflect more. So a lot of us tend to be fairly busy. Our minds are active throughout the day. We have a to-do list with lots of things to do, phone calls, appointments. Um, and when we've stopped doing our to-do list, we tend to do something else, such as watch TV or read a book or the newspaper. We're not very good at just spending time being or perhaps we don't do much at all um, because maybe of the lung disease or other circumstances and you spend the day just lost in your thoughts focused on all the things that you can't do and how life used to be so much better so in a way that sort of person is busy doing nothing but again they're not taking any time just to be and the idea of taking notice is to be more aware of the world around you and also to be more aware of what you're feeling. And if this sounds like mindfulness, then I really think it is. This take notice element of well-being is mindfulness in a different name so it doesn't freak anyone out. So questions to reflect on here. If noticing enhances well-being, then what opportunities can I take or make to enable me to notice things more? How can I slow down what I'm doing and pause more often? And will this really make a difference in my day-to-day -day life? Well, I guess you won't know that one until you try it, but the evidence is there that it will improve your well-being. So we come on to the last of the five ways to well-being, and that's giving. Now this one might seem odd, but the idea is by giving out and doing something for somebody else, uh, that enables you to feel better about yourself. It's looking out as well as looking in. Um, it might involve doing something nice for a friend or even a stranger. Just encouraging somebody or thanking them smiling at a stranger as you walk past them, or giving way to another driver. Or perhaps volunteering your time or joining a community group. The old adage, the more we give, the more we receive, is quite true. Now it's important that you don't give out um, to others uh, out of a sense of politeness, obligation, duty, because that isn't going to improve your well-being. What you want is to give uh, from the heart, uh, uh, truly enjoying the giving. You might even just give your time and listen to somebody. Now. There's a little bit extra here because some people say that they actually find it easy to give to others, but they don't feel as comfortable receiving from others things such as compliments and gifts. Now, giving is a two-way process and by accepting somebody else's gift, that's good for them as well as for you. So our aim should be to be comfortable receiving from others. And there's another element to this that people mention, and that's that it's okay to give to yourself, to be kind and generous to yourself. 
So some questions now to just think about. What do I give to others on a regular basis? What could I give to others that I haven't thought of before? What small gift could I offer that I'll feel good about? And then, what can I give myself? How can I be more generous and appreciative of myself? What treats could I give myself that will improve my experience of life? So those are the five ways to well-being and it's just worthwhile spending some time working out if you are a little bit low in one area because by increasing that you are going to be promoting your emotional well-being. Um, there's a very good PDF booklet on this online uh, from Devon. All you have to do is um, put into a search engine taking steps towards living well Devon and it looks like that. OK, we're changing the topic here and I just wonder if anyone uh, recognises this picture, knows who these two people are. Well, I expect most of you will know that that's Bill and Ben of the Flower Pot Men and that's Little Weed in the middle there. And I'd like you to imagine that we've got Bill on one side of the page here and Ben on the other side. And unfortunately, both of them have been experiencing breathlessness for about three years now. It's gradually got worse and both of them have been diagnosed with uh, IPF type lung fibrosis. Both of them have got the same severity to their disease. Their vital capacity has reduced to 60% and they've both been started on nintendinib. So as you can see they're identical. Now when we talk to Bill he tells us that really his mood is low, he's feeling very negative and he doesn't get out much these days because of the lung fibrosis. Interestingly, when we talk to Ben, there's a slightly different picture. Yes, he's frustrated at times and can get down, but he still enjoys life. And yes, he can't do as much activity as he used to, but he still gets out. He just has to be savvy and careful and pace himself. And this brings me on to my next point. One of the biggest factors that determines someone's happiness or well-being is how they see their situation. Now you'll remember on the first week, I'm sure, or I hope you do, that if you get suddenly acutely breathless, it sets off the internal alarm system in your brain and that causes panic and anxiety. Um, and that's a very good example of the brain impacting on our body. And there are lots of other ways that the brain can affect us. This is a hot cross bun. And really it shows the connections between our thoughts, our feelings, our physical symptoms and our behaviour. And as I've said, we've already sort of explored this, little, this a bit. Uh, we mentioned that severe breathlessness can trigger the internal alarm system and cause panic and anxiety. And the panic and the anxiety can actually then impact our physical symptoms and cause more breathlessness. So there's all these interactions that are going on here. But it doesn't stop there because because we're so breathless that's going to give us uh, probably some negative thoughts on life. And of course because of our negative thoughts on life and our breathlessness we're going to probably alter our behaviour and not go out so much as a result. So you can see already a little bit of a sort of hot cross bun or a spaghetti junction is um, de developing here. And the idea of this hot cross bun is that um, uh, you build up and you write down all the thoughts that you're thinking, all the feelings that you're feeling, and you can sort of analyse your life. This is particularly useful if you think your brain, that is your thoughts and your feelings, might be having a negative impact on your life. And you can take any scenario and analyse your thoughts about it, analyse your feelings, your symptoms, your behaviour, and you just keep adding uh, and working out additional uh, relationships. And then once you've um, put everything down on a paper, or maybe you'll need several pieces of paper to do this, then you can analyse uh, the situation and decide if you want to make any changes.
Now, I can imagine that some of you are going to be sitting there thinking, oh, good grief, this is ridiculous. I don't believe any of this. I don't want to get into my thoughts and my feelings. Uh, uh, Thoughts and feelings impacting physical symptoms. Uh, Not that much, not with me. But I, I want to just take a little bit of time to show you how concrete the evidence is. Uh, that stress in particular can impact on our uh, physical health. So there is lots of evidence now that has uh, amalgamated over the years that shows that stress causes or worsens physical disease. For example, stress reduces our immune system and therefore we can't fight infections so well. Stress definitely causes upper respiratory tract infections. It definitely worsens asthma. They're not quite so sure, but they think it increases exacerbation rates in people with COPD. Stress definitely increases your risk of having a heart attack or high blood pressure or strokes. And believe it or not, if you've got cancer, the more stressed you are, the more likely the cancer is to progress. Now, this uh, field of research is called psychoneuroimmunology. Uh, Psycho meaning your thoughts, neuro meaning the brain itself with all the little um, neurons, and immunology meaning the way that um, uh, the body uh, protects itself and fights infection and inflammation. And the two people who did most of the research in the early days was a psychologist called Janice Kaikolt and her friend and subsequent uh, husband, immunologist Ronald Glazer. And they did a lot of uh, work. And I'm just going to give you a couple of their studies now because I just think it's um, really interesting. So they took 13 people who were caring for a spouse or somebody with Alzheimer's. And we know that Alzheimer's is a is a tricky disease and it is very stressful caring for somebody who has Alzheimer's. And they then took 13 healthy people of the same age who weren't carers. And none of these people had any other health issues or anything. They were healthy people. And they were all given a skin punch biopsy. Now, I'll show you pictures of what that looks like in a minute. But it's basically a wound in the skin that gradually heals over a number of weeks. And they photographed the wound every few days and measured it uh, to see how, how big it was. This is um, how a punch biopsy is uh, performed. It's a bit like, do you remember those potato guns that we had years ago? You uh, pushed the end of the gun into the potato and a bit of potato got stuck in the end of the gun and then when you shot it, the potato went out and hit somebody else. This is the same sort of principle. So you put this punch biopsy in the skin and it just sort of cuts all round. Um, sometimes it just comes out as it, it, as it uh, immediately. Sometimes you have to just cut off a little stalk there. I hope this isn't making anybody feel queasy. Uh, and then after that, you just put a stitch across to, um, to close it up normally. But in this case, in this research project, they didn't. They just left it open to heal gradually by shrinking over the weeks. And uh, this is a graph of what they found. And the bottom line is the people who were stressed as carers for people with Alzheimer's, uh, their wounds took far longer to heal than the people who were non-stressed. And again, every week when they looked at the size of the wound, the wounds of people who were the carers, the stressed carers, were bigger than the wounds of the non-stressed control people. It's amazing, isn't it? You wouldn't have thought that stress would actually uh, alter wound healing like that. Uh, Another study they did looked at dental students. They managed to persuade 11 dental students to have two punch biopsies, not in their skin this time, but in their mouth, at the top of their mouth on the hard palate. And they each had two skin, uh, uh, two punch biopsies. The first wound was given to them during the summer holidays when they should have been quite relaxed. And the next wound was given in the same mouth on their mouth, but on the opposite side, three days before their first major exam. And they looked at the wound healing again. Now, my thoughts on this are that, you know, 
Come on, these students have exams the whole time. They're used to doing exams. I don't think I ever got that stressed before uh, exams, did I? I mean, you know, I might have been a little bit stressed, but not drastically stressed, surely. And again, the results were similar. Uh, the, uh, the results showed that uh, the wounds inflicted during the summer holidays healed faster than the wounds inflicted just before the exams. Again, very much suggesting that stress impairs wound healing. Um, so we know for definite that the body doesn't heal so well when it's stressed. We also know, I haven't shown you evidence, that the body can't fight its infection so well when it's stressed. And being stressed long term can actually increase the inflammatory response in the body, which can be damaging to the body. And it's not just stress, uh, sort of anxiety that can cause this effect. Uh, people have also investigated anger and shown that people who have ongoing anger and frustration end up damaging their body similarly. So, having done a little bit of a detour and told you about that, we're coming back to our hot cross bun and I'm hoping that now you're a little bit more convinced that it's worthwhile looking at the hot cross bun and seeing how we can change things. Because wouldn't it be a shame if your thoughts and your feelings were causing additional physical symptoms? So, you know, if you were able to get your thoughts and, con and feelings under control a bit more, you'd end up with less breathlessness and less fatigue uh, than you currently have. That's, that's the idea of this. So I'm going to give you an example of how to do a hot cross bun and I'm going to think about somebody who's got breathing problems and they're, they're planning to walk to their friend's house around the corner and just the thought of walking to their friend's house makes them feel well, it gives them these thoughts. Good grief, am I ever going to make it? You know, I could end up stuck halfway on the road. I mean, will there be anywhere to sit down? And those are very understandable thoughts that somebody might have. Uh, but of course, these thoughts are going to lead to feelings. And I expect the most obvious feelings that this person will be experiencing it will be anxiousness and panickiness, I'd have thought. On the other hand, they may actually feel end up feeling quite irritated and angry as well. They might think back to how they were 10 years ago when they could have easily just nipped round the corner without thinking about it and now, you know, it feels like a, an expedition to Everest just to get round the corner. Now, as we know, particularly feelings of anxiety and panic are going to impact on physical symptoms and they're going to do the and, and they're going to cause the fight flight or freeze response aren't they with um, increasing breathlessness palpitations butterflies in your stomach uh, dry mouth sweaty shaking all over wobbly legs needing to go to the loo even um, those are all a stress response in the body um, and the, one of the key things to note here is these thoughts and these feelings that somebody might be experiencing just before thinking about walking to their friend's house probably will carry on in some way uh, throughout the day and the next day and the next day because they're always going to have a problem getting around and doing activity. Um, so these thoughts and these feelings are going to be staying long term and of course, that means that the additional physical symptoms that they're causing are likely to stay long term as well. So this is this is really crucial stuff, I think. Well, let's go on. Uh, having such thoughts and feelings and physical symptoms is, is very inevitably going to impact on your behaviour. And probably this person is going to maybe not go to their friend's house. Uh, they're going to stay in more and they're going to do less activity generally. They're going to see less of friends and they may stop doing hobbies. But the hot cross bun doesn't stop there because these connections and these, uh, these cause and effect carry on. Because if you imagine that they're not seeing their friends so much, they're going to become lonely and depressed. Maybe, maybe they're going to feel lonely and depressed. Um, and because they're not doing so much activity, then we know uh, if you don't use it, you lose it. And they're going to have re reduced muscle fitness and their heart's going to get deconditioned and they're going to get more breathless. 
And it would be very reasonable, wouldn't it, with all this going on, for them to feel that their life is not worth living. And, uh, you know, what's the point of going on? So you can keep going on and on with your hot cross bun until you've worked out all the possible details. Um, and then, once you've got all the details down on a piece of paper, you can start to analyse it. You can, first of all, look at your thoughts and you can say, are, are these thoughts fact or are they my opinion? And for a lot of our thoughts, they're going to be our opinion and not necessarily going to happen. So, you know, the thoughts, I'll never be able to make it. You might think to yourself, well, actually, do you know, I have made it. Every time I've gone round to my friend's house, I've made it. Uh, most of the time, it's actually all right. But there was that time when I got really breathless halfway round. And um, uh, I did actually think I might die uh, at, at that point. It was really scary. But that's only happened once. And that was because I was rushing, wasn't it? So, um, you know, I should be all right if I take it nice and steadily and do my pacing. Uh, you know, I should I should be able to make it. So that's a way of just correcting your thoughts a bit. Uh, your thoughts weren't, um, well, your thoughts were very reasonable, your initial thoughts, but you might want to correct them and actually make them more balanced, having thought about it a bit more. Um, it's not relevant particularly to this, but other thoughts like, you know, um, uh, you might be, maybe maybe you're upset, you know, um, somebody's um, said something in a meeting and they were really quite disrespectful. Um, your thought might be, this is just so embarrassing, I don't know how on earth I'm ever going to look at everyone again. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know whether I want to come to work anymore, something like that. And when you look at that sort of thought, you might want to ask yourself, how important is it? Is this going to be important to me in a year? And the answer is probably not. You can say, what's the bigger picture here? And um, you can think, well, to be honest, probably nobody else noticed that comment nearly as much as, as I did. Uh, maybe I should just keep calm, carry on and ignore it. So you can alter your thoughts. Another thing you can do is um, uh, look at your feelings. Now, when you look at your feelings, do you remember we've said that with feelings, with the limbic um, brain, you have got to acknowledge them. You can't suppress them. If you try and suppress them, they'll come out at some other time, pop at the wrong time, and it could just be very awkward. So you need to be real and honest and acknowledge your feelings. But then you need to decide how much you're going to act on them. Uh, um, do you want to actually deliberately focus on some other feelings that sort of balance them out. For your physical symptoms, we've covered this a lot, but you want to minimise your physical symptoms because the more symptoms you have, the more there's going to be a tendency for it to cause uh, other uh, negative thoughts and feelings uh, and, and behaviour on this hot cross bun. So the more we can minimise the physical symptoms, the better. And we've already talked at length about controlling your breathing and even having an action plan in place so that you know what to do when you get acutely breathless. Um, and then we've also talked about managing fatigue. Those are the two really big areas for people with breathlessness normally. And then you want to look at what you've written down under behaviour. And you want to ask yourself, um, OK, am I going to let my actions be dictated by this hot cross bun? And I, am I willing to not see any friends anymore just because uh, I'm, I'm so anxious and panicky uh, and it's just such an effort? Or do I actually want to change my behaviour and do things differently now I'm looking into things a bit? Sometimes you're stuck on what to think and how to analyse the situation and generally what you can say once you've written it all down is OK, so what would I say to a friend if a friend was telling me all this over a cup of coffee, what would I say, what would my advice be? Or, you know, what would somebody else make of it? Would they think this is reasonable or would they think, oh, you know, no, this is a silly response? What, what would they say? And that can be quite helpful. Um... I think the hot cross bun method is quite useful and I've uh, used it myself 
on a number of occasions um, and I've even used it on my husband when he didn't know. Uh, he was in a, just a really bad negative mood and it seemed to be sort of staying for quite some time and um, uh, he, he didn't seem to really want to talk about it much and, um, but we sat down and I said, uh, you know, Han, I said, you know, I really want to understand things. Are you just able to just uh, tell me what you're feeling, please? And, um, and he did. So I wrote down on this piece of paper all that he was feeling. I said, OK, all right, so what thoughts have you got? And I went through it like this. And um, uh, I said, OK, well, that's a bit clearer to me, hun. I think that must be difficult. Uh, so I didn't really try to give him any solutions because people don't like solutions, do they? Uh, and afterwards he said it was really helpful going through it and uh, it, he just it seemed to lift his mood so I think it's there's definitely something in this what we're really saying with this uh, hot cross bun uh, method is we're looking and working out what we can change what we want to change what we are happy to accept or what we want to let go of so there's a few questions here that you might want to ask yourself um, about change. What can I change? Can I change the environment or the situation or my reaction to it? And uh, do I want to change now or later? And what, what do I do first? And then if you think there's something that you might want to accept, then you, you might say, OK, well, it is as it is. I've just got to accept this situation. Or you might say to yourself, I don't have to agree with it. Um, or, you know, I'm not going to think about this. I'm not going to make a decision now. I'm just going to uh, just hold it there. I can always think about it later. Or if it's the sort of panic sensation that rises in bodies quite uh, frequently, you might just say, OK, this is a normal reaction. My internal alarm system has gone off. I'm not going to fight it or stop it. It'll just pass. And then there might be some other situations where you decide you want to just let go of it. Perhaps your daughter has said something offensive and it's really upset you and it's just going round and round your head. And uh, you ask yourself, is it worth it? Is this something that I can leave and let go of and move on? Um, there's a lot of evidence that if you don't forgive someone, you let them live rent free in your head. Um, so you're constantly thinking about the situation and what they've done to hurt you and you can't really enjoy the rest of your life because you're so focused on this situation. It's much better in those sort of situations to let go and just move on, if at all possible. So what we're really saying is be real about your circumstances and be particularly honest about what you're feeling. And this is going to be difficult for someone who's got lung disease because, uh, in a way, it's going to involve you accepting that your life has changed and you can't do the things that you once did and that you want to do. You'll need to adapt to your lifestyle and activities. You may have to let go of some things. If you really enjoyed badminton or squash, that may be something that you have to let go of. But the key thing is to continue to take part in life and to enjoy life as much as you can. The Alcoholics uh, Anonymous AA have a um, have these little tokens that they give out once you've not been abstinent for a month or two months or three months or six months or a year. They give you a, a different token. And on the back of each token is this prayer called the Serenity Prayer. And it just seems appropriate in what we're doing here. It says, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Now, all this hot cross bun business and everything is the basics of cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, which is one of the main sort of counselling, talking therapies that uh, we can do. Um, and um, uh, if you think exploring this might be useful, then you can get going on what I've already uh, shared with you. But there's more information online at this Get Self Help um, site. Or, if you'd prefer, you can self-refer yourself to the Derbyshire Talking Therapy Group. Um, you can just search online there for Derbyshire Healthcare 
interested in talking therapy page and you can sign up. Phew, uh, that's a long, quite intense section uh, that we've just covered there. We're now going to much more quickly cover support for carers, future care planning and then other things that you can consider after FAB. So, support for carers. I think uh, any carer watching this will agree that although caring for someone can be very rewarding, it's also a lot of work and very tough at times. Many carers feel socially isolated um, and in fact more than 75% of carers say that they have no life outside their caring role. 85% of carers say that caring has had a negative impact on their own mental and physical health. And it's also common to have uh, lost out financially as a result of starting being a carer. So. I just want you to know that there is support for carers out there. There are two very good organisations in Derby, the Derbyshire Carers Association and the Carers in Derbyshire group. And uh, you can see their web pages there. Uh, they can help in all sorts of different ways. They can come either to your house or to, uh, or you can come to their office or they can meet up somewhere else and do a carer assessment and uh, look at uh, your eligibility for a personal budget uh, as a carer. They can give benefit advice, legal advice, including lasting power of attorney and wills. Um, they can uh, give support and counselling. They can give advice on travel and emergency cover. So, for example, if you got ill, what would happen to the person you're caring for? Um, they can uh, they, they have a lot of social events and a befriending service. There's a lot going on there and I would very much recommend that if you're in a caring uh, position that you, if you haven't done so already, make contact with these organisations. Now this section is all about planning for the future uh, because of course your lung condition possibly could get worse over time. I think it's fortunate that we can't really work out exactly what's going to happen to somebody over time. It's actually, it's very difficult with um, lung disease to work out how the future is going to pan out. Um, but because the future is unknown, it's a good idea to plan ahead in advance um, in case you have an unexpected uh, health crisis. Now, don't worry, you don't, nobody's going to force you to do this. It's your decision if you want to think ahead and it's very understandable that some people are going to feel uncomfortable even thinking about this because I guess as you think about your lung condition possibly progressing it just makes you think good grief you know am I going to die soon um, and we're not used to talking about getting worse and, and dying are we in the UK particularly. So you might say if it's going to be a bit uncomfortable why should we bother? Well, there's very good evidence that by planning for the future, you end up with better health care and be better mental care. So if you've talked about uh, how you'd like things to uh, go, what sort of treatments you'd like in the future, you're more likely to get the sort of care and treatment you want. And also, if you've planned ahead, you feel more in control and you're going to feel more, and rela more relaxed and at peace about the situation. And it's interesting, it's not only the person with the lung disease uh, who feels more relaxed and at peace. Uh, carers and, and relatives also say they feel more uh, content and relaxed because they know that if something serious does happen, there's now information to guide the medical team. It doesn't all fall on their head. They're not responsible for everything. The other thing to note is that you can always alter a future care plan at any point in the future, so it's not uh, written in stone. So if you're going to plan a little bit for the future, what might you want to consider? Well, as I've said, uh, it's important to, uh, for us to know your views on different treatments and types of care that you might want. Uh, for example, would you want to have non-invasive ventilation? Do you know what non-invasive ventilation is? Um, 
uh, when you're acutely unwell, nobody's going to be able to explain it properly to you. It's, not, uh, it's much better to think about these things in the clear light of day. If you've been in hospital for a number of weeks on end and you're not improving, do you want everybody just to keep going with all possible aggressive treatment? Um, do you want that to happen even if there's only a very slim chance of recovery? It's these sort of questions that it's worthwhile talking through and then uh, if you want we can just sort of write it in a, um, a future care plan and it just helps people uh, know what you want. Most uh, care plans also have a special section discussing uh, resuscitation, that's cardiopulmonary resuscitation. That's when the heart or the lungs stop and you try and restart the heart or the lungs with the cardiac massage or the sort of breaths into the lungs. Now the important thing to note here is to be honest, if you've got a severe heart or lung disease, the chance of um, CPR resuscitation being successful is very, very small. If your lungs have stopped due to your lung disease, then it's very unlikely that we're going to be able to restart it. But it's really worthwhile discussing whether you want resuscitation or not with a health professional and really understanding the nitty-gritty of it before making a decision. Other questions that you might like to consider are if you're thought to be in the last stages of life where would you like to be cared for? Would you prefer to stay at home uh, with your family or would you prefer to be in hospital or somewhere else? Sometimes there are practical issues such as, you know, if you're the carer for a child who's got some learning disability, you need to make sure that people are aware of that and will then look after your child if you become ill and that can be written into a care plan. Similarly, if you have a cat that's uh, very precious or a dog, some animal that needs looking after, that can be written down. The other thing that often is written down is who to contact in an emergency and that's very useful for the paramedics. These discussions are often documented in some sort of care plan and the one that we tend to use in Derbyshire at the moment is the respect form. It's important to note that this document is not legally binding so whatever's written there people can override it. Um, so ex for example if you fall, fall through a glass window and you've got cuts all over yourself and you're bleeding out then just because your respect form says you know don't attempt resuscitation it doesn't mean people wouldn't because it's in a it's a different scenario and people uh, will adapt um, to uh, accordingly so this is what the respect form looks like respect stands for recommended summary plan for emergency care and treatment and uh, uh, the front page has got all the details about uh, uh, the sort of care that the person wants and the back really is just um, uh, signatures and documenting who to contact in an emergency. So section two of the front talks about uh, a, a quick summary of what the, the particular health issues the person has got. And then section three um, asks, are you wanting us to prioritize life as much as possible, even if it's at the expense of some comfort? Or alternatively, are you wanting us to prioritize comfort, knowing that maybe uh, we're not going to be sustaining life for quite so long, but priority is the comfort there? Or sort of are you anywhere between those two and you can see that sort of line uh, that white line going between those two areas of lilac and you can put a cross anywhere on that line and then the section below section four is really uh, guidance uh, you saying specific treatments that you do want or that you don't want whether you want to come into hospital or not uh, and then there's uh, boxes at the bottom on whether resuscitation that CPR attempts are recommended or not recommended there. Now you may find that if you come into hospital you have a respect form completed 
and there hasn't really been a big discussion with you. Uh, that's not good because uh, respect forms are meant to involve a full discussion with the person and if they wish also with their family and that because of the busyness in the hospital that just quite often doesn't happen so if you've got a respect form and not much is written on it then you might want to get a revised one with more detail because uh, uh, that will be far more useful to people looking after you in the future rather than the, just the uh, scanty one. Other aspects that you might want to consider is whether to have a will or not, whether to make a will, whether to appoint a lasting power of attorney, and if there's any treatment that you definitely do not want, because then you can make a legally uh, binding document refusing treatment. Because do you remember that the respect form is just for guidance and somebody can override it if they want. There are a couple of documents online which might be quite helpful to look at. You can pause if you want and uh, get the details of those. And then if you do want to do any future planning, then it's obviously best to have a face-to-face -face discussion with somebody and we could either do that um, uh, in our one-to-one -one session post-fab or you could discuss it with your GP or specialist nurse or your hospital consultant. Now we're very nearly at the end of this fab course and uh, the question that often people are asking at this point is what next? They've really enjoyed meeting up with other people and making social connections and uh, you know this is a, just a very small three week course and uh, people are, are feeling uh, sad that it's over. <laughs> But within the Impact Plus team, we have a few other social groups for you to join. Um, Treetops has a wellbeing cafe that anyone can drop into. And then there are loads of other community groups in your local area, which the care coordinator at the GP surgery will know all about. So you might want to phone them up and say, you know, I'm interested in being more... Uh, social in my local area, you know, I've got a lung condition, I can't walk very far, what's out there? And they may just send you a whole load of bump through the post or they may talk to you over the phone. I, I don't know what they'll do, they'll probably all do different things, but I know that the care coordinator has a lot of information. So just briefly, I want to tell you about Lungs for Life. That's a social community group that meets every Wednesday in Oakwood. We have great fun there. It's a very welcoming group that um, is um, good at including new people. Um, sometimes we just sit and have coffee and tea and chat. Other times we're playing a few board games or um, bingo or doing a quiz. Um, sometimes we get the indoor bowls out and either watch or participate in that. Um, all sorts of things. And sometimes uh, we go to a pub uh, afterwards um, just to have a, um, a meal, an early tea, uh, which is very nice and social. Another um, activity that you might like to join in is our singing groups. Um, they are held at Holland Ward and Little Eton. Uh, they're not just singing groups because part of the group deliberately focuses on improving your respiratory muscles and your breath control. Um, so they're tailored particularly for people who have got a breathing problem to actually strengthen and uh, uh, reset their breathing patterns. And people really enjoy those. If you've got lung fibrosis, you might be interested in joining the Derby uh, Pulmonary Fibrosis Support Group and the details are there. There's also uh, a group that used to be uh, a local Breathe Easy group but has now gone independent and they're the Happy Lung group uh, and they meet uh, monthly and are very socially active um, uh, doing all sorts of different activities. They meet in the Age UK hut in Shadderston. And then there's the Wellbeing Cafe at Treetops. Now Treetops is a hospice and that might just make you feel good grief 
uh, are they really telling me about a hospice? You probably don't really need uh, a hospice right now, or maybe maybe it's going to be of benefit. But just uh, having gone to treetops, having dropped in for uh, coffee, um, you'll know a bit about them. Um, they'll be able to tell you about the services that they are able to offer. And it just may be a useful introduction uh, for later on down the line. Uh, you never know. Um, so you can drop in any time between 10 and 3.30 on a Thursday. And it's it's free to have coffee, cake and that sort of thing. If you want lunch, uh, they'll provide you with lunch um, and donations are welcome. But if you don't want to pay, nobody will force you. Uh, it's a lovely um, environment and uh, people who have gone there um, have sort of got more and more involved in treetops and, and normally love it. So what next? Well, as well as uh, building up... Um, uh, community around you which is what we've just been talking about I think it's worthwhile building up a medical support network around you uh, you don't want just to rely on uh, one area for help you want to have a group of people that you can go to uh, if there's a problem because you're more likely then to to, to get uh, uh, the support that you need so you've obviously got your GP practice and you've got the impact plus team you can consider joining these Breathe Easy, uh, su these peer support groups such as uh, the Breathe Easy group or the Lung Fibrosis group. Um, you may have a good relationship with your hospital consultant. You may have connected to treetops. And then there's the national support groups that you might find useful as well. Uh, there's one particularly for pulmonary fibrosis and then there's the main one, the British Lung Foundation, which is a brilliant site. They've got a wealth of information on their site. If you just click on support for you, then you can get to all sorts of areas, including these um, uh, titles. And I think you'll find that very valuable. So this is the end of the fab course. It's been a very long um, video, but I hope you found it informative and useful. Um, I'm anticipating that you're now probably going to book the one-to-one -one post fab clinic consultation if you've been on the formal course. Um, you may have other symptoms such as a cough that we haven't covered and you'll be able to discuss that on a one-to-one -one, uh, basis um, and there may be other issues that you've got and we may not be able to help directly within the impact plus team but we may then be able to signpost you on to other areas that can help it has felt very odd delivering this fab course as a video because normally we're all sitting around in a group chatting having fun interacting and building up relationships but i hope you uh, feel that uh, we want to support you. We realise that having a lung disease is not easy and I hope uh, uh, above everything else that you're able to live life to the max despite it all.